Joining yeah. us now is a man who's had to have enough load management conversation. Now, I think he's probably done with it for the rest of his life. An absolute stallion of a human who has created a tournament that has captivated not just the basketball world, but the sports world in the middle of the season in which he is the commissioner of. The fifth commissioner of the association. Ladies and gentlemen, Adam Silver. Yeah! Thank you. Thank you for that intro. Hey, I want to let you know this, Adam. C Commish, Adam, Mr. Silver, what should I call you? Adam, please. Adam, Pat. Okay. Adam, there is never a time in my life where I thought this would be happening right here, <laughs> me and you. So, like, thank you for doing this, Yeah, Commish. yeah absolutely. Woo! Hey, uh, long-time listener, first-time caller. Okay. I like oh. to hear that. Now, you need to remain a smart human being, so let's listen to our show in short bursts uh, so we don't ruin you. Uh, let's dive in here, though, Adam. So... The in-season tournament, the NBA Cup, whenever it was first announced, I think a lot of people thought it was a sham, a fugaze, what is this? Last night, obviously, with the way that game ends, there's a big conversation, but then Kevin Durant was interviewed after the game. Here's what he had to say about the NBA Cup in the in-season tournament. I wasn't a huge fan of the in-season tournament when they were announcing it and coming up with the idea, but um, today, Leading up to the game, like, it felt like a playoff game. From... Hey, can you stop? It felt like a playoff game from just friends, family, fans, just so excited about it. Just the courts was different. Just the vibe around, like, last night was a great night for the game with those two, two incredible games that were on. You know, so it felt like a playoff game coming into it and, like, waking up this morning. So... Uh, I wasn't a huge fan, but now I'm, uh, I'm excited about the end season tournament. I'm pissed that we're not going to Vegas to try to win this thing, but um, it definitely made me a fan. Okay, so obviously that is a huge motion of support from one of your biggest stars in the league. Are you taking a victory lap with this thing? Because we saw the reaction whenever it was announced and you stood firm behind it. And how do you think it's panned out? And when are you giving yourself a parade for this thing, Adam? Well, no victory lap yet. Let's wait till we get through Saturday. So we got, okay. of course, you know, Thursday semifinals and and the ultimate cup game. And thanks for wearing that jersey hey. on Saturday. Thank you. Uh, you know, one thing that we knew from the beginning it was so interesting to hear Kevin there, because when people ask me, how would you know if it was successful? Of course, you can look at attendance. You can look at ratings and social media chatter. And even the fact that we're talking about it now are, are all signs of success. But I said, It'll be measured in terms of the enthusiasm of the players. Um, will they take it seriously? Will they compete? Will they play, you know, as opposed to load management in these regular season games? Um, will they care about winning? Will they care about going to Vegas? Will they care about the prize money? And it seems like KD just checked off the whole list right there in terms of things, including the colorful courts that I know are a little bit controversial. <laughs> but so I think from that standpoint, a great start. And, and in terms of our, our, our you know, belief that this could be successful, again, you think 30% of the players in this league roughly are born outside the United States. Many of them grew up soccer fans around the world or competing in international basketball tournaments um, where there were often cups along the way. I mean, I had a kind of conversation the, the other day with J.J. Redick, of course, a colleague on ESPN now. And even he and I were talking about when he was at Duke that they, they didn't call them cup competitions, but there was holiday tournaments and, you know, the Alaska shootout and things like that. And so, and, and LeBron, as LeBron said, the, I think it was last night too, after the game, that these are the most competitive people in the world. And if you give them a format to compete and their prizes and, and, and you know, it's, it's structured in a way where they can do things like get to Vegas and get additional prize money, they're going to be all in. So I, I'm thrilled to see that. You know, I'll only say in terms of the victory lap, you know, a lot of learning from the first time around lot that people want to talk about. I'm sure we can improve on it, but we're off to a great start. Yeah, you talk about those tournaments. I think Dickie V Classic is happening right yeah. now at Madison Square Garden, amongst mm -hmm. other things. Anytime you put a little bit more, you know, elevated pressure on an event, normally the athletes, as in incredibly competitive humans, will show up for it. Your NBA guys have. What are you learning about this one for next year? And is this going to be an every year thing now? That's obviously the plan? Yeah, the, the plan would be for it to be an, an, an every year thing. I, I think what we're learning, you know, there's been some controversy around the point differentials, using those to, 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 to decide seeding. Again, that was another concept we took from international competition. 
not just international soccer, but in FIBA tournaments, even in the Olympics, they've always used differentials um, during that initial you know, group stage before you get to the knockout round to decide ties. So that was something we did here. Uh, you know, and I, and I, I heard some of the commentary you know, from coaches, some of the players about whether we think it's the right message where teams are, are increasing leads you know, beyond the point that's necessary to win, but where those differentials become important for seeding. Again, it may be that once everybody has a full understanding that this is part of international competition, they'll be okay with it. But I also want to react. I guess I, I understand it's culturally different here. And if people think that goes against the, the notions of sportsmanship that we grew up with, maybe we got to make some changes there. I think on the courts, I like the colorful courts. I'm a big fan of those. You know, they because it was sort of a last minute initiative, they were somewhat cookie cutter. I mean, teams had okay. color options, but right. they kind of, there's a similar look to all of them. I think next year we could have a lot of fun with teams saying, here are the parameters, but, you know, do the Louis Vuitton court, or whatever, you know, do, do, some, do, some, do some fun stuff, you know, go out there, have partnerships, you know, do, you know, we could have fan contests around the courts and stuff like that. Obviously there was some initial issues of players where there, there was a concern of whether the way they were painted, there was some slipperiness and stuff. Obviously we've got to make sure they're safe, but I think it's, it's sort of a license you know, we've had the play in now, you know, now with the in-season tournament, just to do more, you know, honestly, you know, look what you've done with your show and, and chart, you know, new formats, new approaches, new ways of doing things. That's, it's not that different for us. You know, you, we're all competing well, for an audience. We're competing for interest and we learn from each other. Well, you all have brains. We do not. So <laughs> yeah. everything you do will be calculated. And I'll, on the courts thing. Whenever you're walking through, let's say, an airport or a restaurant or something, mm -hmm. and you see it on a screen, you're naturally just going to stop and kind of look. So I, I think as a stooge, as like a, a kind of zoom, I liked it. I enjoyed it. Could you imagine a skims court next year? <laughs> Adam Silver in his tights yeah. from one side of the court yeah. to the other. Yeah. Just a whole side of that thing in your skims. Huh? That would be great. That's uh, you, you need a skims deal. No, no, no! <laughs> you. They, have, they, it, 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 they got tank tops. They got they got a whole <laughs> wardrobe for you. But you know what's interesting? Hearing Katie on the courts too. Like one thing I've learned over a lot of years at the NBA that players are not that different than fans in terms of. And you know, for, as, as they an were NFL once player, fans, like once they, fans. They, mm -hmm. but also as a guy, like you're responding even when you're in the league, like to what your friends are saying, to what the media is saying, and and I think the notion I hadn't thought of this that even players would get up because they'd see that the court's different. That, it, that you know, we were thinking in terms of the visual medium, to your point, somebody walking through an airport in a bar or in flipping their channels and seeing something different is going on tonight because the court looks very different. I hadn't thought that much about the fact that a player taking the floor would be saying, yeah, something's very different tonight. It's not a regular season game. The court looks completely different. And, and, and I always forget sometimes all those trappings are as meaningful for the players and the coaches and the community as much as the fans who are watching it. Yeah, it just feels different. You know, anytime something feels different, it's like, because 82 games, a lot of games. And obviously, you chatted about load management. We were talking about that. I think the 65 rule feels like that's a good yeah, hey, yeah. Mark. Feels like you figured Thanks. it out. Feels like you threaded the, the needle in that entire thing. I want to talk, though, about the international conversation, because you said 30% of your league is international. And obviously, right. superstars now. Joker, MVP. Yeah. Yep. Luca, right. Obviously, Giannis is Giannis, a guy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's just so many of why do you think your game and your league is so international, so diverse whenever it comes to, you know, players from other countries coming in? And do you see that growing? Or are we at the peak right now where it's at? Oh, it's, I mean, and add to the list the first pick from last year's draft, Victor Wembanyama, of course, in San Antonio, yeah. now the French player. Right. So, hey, he's cheating, so, isn't he? Isn't he kind of <laughs> cheating, that guy? He, you know, yeah. he's... So, you know, I think <laughs> a lot of credit, I, I would say, goes back to, frankly, James Naismith. When he created this game, mm -hmm. he was a missionary. At a, you know, he was a Christian missionary, but he began this game famously at a YMCA in Springfield, Massachusetts. He then, the YMCA organization, then took this game globally in the 1890s to China, to, to, to throughout Europe, you know, to Australia, to everywhere in the world because they saw it as an opportunity for young men, that's it was focused on men at the time, to stay active. It, it's, it's interesting, the values, put aside the religious aspect of it, are not all th that different than the values we preach today in terms of the importance of 
physical activity, of team play, of respect. I mean, if, if, if you go back to the, to the origins of the game. But so anyway, like by virtue of those people who began, who developed the game and saw an opportunity to take this game globally, it then became an Olympic sport in the 1930s. And we're a huge beneficiary of that. And even now, if you look at those international players that we talked about, those star players in the league, most of them came up through state-sponsored sports systems, which is, you know, I was reminding people outside of the United States, most governments have a cabinet level officer, sort of a, a minister of sport, you know, a secretary of sport that oversees sport in that country and oversees development. I mean, for example, if you think about a, a relatively small market like Australia, which has about 25 million people, at last I looked, I think they have 13 NBA players. Oh you know, from, from a market that's small and it, and it's not DNA. It's because of the systems they have, you know, in place to help, you know, teach physical education, to identify top stars, boys and girls, develop them along top notch competition. You see in Serbia, Slovenia, you see these small countries with these great sport traditions. So I think as, as we continue to be engaged in international competition, uh, our, World Cup of Basketball, everybody talks about the World Cup of, uh, of Soccer, Football internationally, but the World Cup of Basketball is beginning to get right. more attention. In you know, we have a Paris Olympics coming up mm -hmm. and the Summer Olympics. Basketball has been a huge deal. And then you're going to have LA, you know, in 28, coming after 24 in Paris, you know, will be a big deal there. So I think as, as more young people get connected to this game, and that's where social media and digital media has been incredible, we're, we're expanding. You know, we, we, we added a new league in Africa in the middle of pandemic. We got, listen to the statistic, 10% of current players in the NBA were either born in Africa or one of their parents was born in Africa. So they're, you know, a continent with over a billion people, 55 countries, enormous amount of basketball being played there. We're the number one sport in China right now in terms of participation and interest. Um, we're, we're, we're making leaps and bounds in India, in these huge population centers in the world. I think part of it is because it's an, it's, it's an incredibly difficult game to master, but it's a relatively easy game to play. I always say, like, growing up in the suburbs of New York, it's why they use basketball in gym class. <laughs> you know, it's like, mm -hmm. here you go. You run that way or that way. You got to dribble it. You can't carry it. And, and you can grasp the concept. And you can keep kids physically engaged. So I think that number, as you look at the pool of players, boys and girls who are playing this game around the world, that number getting close to 30% of international players in the NBA, uh, you know, similarly in the WNBA, those numbers are only going to grow. Okay. I think I saw some videos of some monks. Oh, yeah. yeah. Some step back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't even think they were talking to each other. No, no. Nope. They were letting their game speak. Straight and up. I saw a little hezzy. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, it was, it was a pro. Oh, hey, yeah. some of those monks were a problem. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> some of those monks were a problem that I was watching. Uh, do you feel an obligation to be a part of, like, international relations? I mean, you said one country that I think we're not necessarily, like, the tightest with right now. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You, are no. you a part of that? Do you get pulled into those types of conversations? I I get pulled in though, not always in a positive way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in terms of what we're doing, I, I I will say, you know, I I was reading a lot of those long obituaries around you know, Henry Kissinger's death, you know, at a hundred, and I, you know, I where he was sort of an exemplar of one of the great global diplomats, and I want to say I understand. I mean, this is going to be far afield, maybe of your question. I, of course, believe we have to have a strong military. I'm a big believer in it. At the same time, you know, call it soft power or call it diplomacy. I think through sport, yes. through culture, through arts, it brings connectivity uh, together with, you know, people of, of diverse cultures and backgrounds. Basketball is one of those sports. I mean, you know, again, you know, as, as an athlete, even I think what connects you to people you know, by virtue of your career in the NFL, talking about sports, but then using that as a platform, just as we are now, to talk about other things. So, you know, I'm not, uh, uh, you know, I'm a sports executive, I'm not a diplomat, but I think the things that we do around the world by participating in these national games, Olympic games, by taking our games globally, by bringing international players to the United States, by showcasing the very best, by people seeing our values, of this game around the world, these principles, this I call it like the rule of law. It's interesting that the World Cup of soccer and football was in Qatar, you know, 200 countries participating. Everyone accepted those were the rules. Whatever was going on in those countries, whatever autocrat or dictator, whoever was running those countries, everyone accepted for on that pitch, on that soccer field, 
when the ref made the decision, they might disagree with it, but those are the rules, and then a winner is declared at the end of the tournament. And that's sort of sports teaches those values. And just lastly, you know, it, it you know, this is an issue in the United States, but really for the whole world, even though we're seeing more prosperity in many places, you continue to see issues around childhood obesity, diabetes, and in many cases, because kids aren't active. So that's a whole separate issue that you need fun, engaging platforms like sports just to keep kids running and, and, and engaged and wanting to be outside and, and, and wanting to do things with physical coordination, you know, playing football, you name it. I mean, I've, uh, so, so that all becomes very important. And I think sports is very unique from that standpoint. Sports are the greatest thing on earth. Yep. Sports are the greatest unifier. Sports are something that bring everybody together. Sports are something that actually have people actually put their swords aside. Yeah. And let's go ahead and compete. It's the greatest thing on earth. And sports are the reason why I know so much about Serbian horses. That's right. Yeah. right. I know a lot about those right. horses over there. You know, I, when the Olympics were created, they stopped war for the Olympics. Yeah. So just to your point about putting your swords down. Yeah, sports are awesome. Uh, let's talk about the business side of it all because you obviously have to handle all of that. I've always argued, now the NFL's ratings are stupid. You know, the NFL, you, everybody knows that. The NFL's ratings are bananas. That's a, that's a compliment, Roger. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Roger doesn't watch his show. Nope. <laughs> Roger doesn't watch his show. But if he does, you know, you're like, hey, well, Roger. Check it out. Roger, you know, it happens. Um, whenever, I've always said that the NBA runs social. You know, you guys are a social media league. Now, linear ratings certainly matter. I understand for business-wise, those things matter. But you guys dominate on social and on digital. I assume that's a strategy, that's a plan. And how do you make that business profitable for you guys? Because you're going to be tasked with kind of leading into the new frontier of being a league that has fully embraced the digital and social media landscape. Yeah, well, like, I think part of it is endemic to our game. When you think about our players, um, in the NBA, you know, they're dressed like you are, Pat. Yeah, <laughs> it's like good. they, you know, it's it's like you see them. They're full body. They're the 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 best players. They're on the floor, virtually the entire game, and they become in essence like YouTube stars. And it, it's interesting they are when you look at the kind of social media followings they have, and that by fans feeling that proximity to them. I mean, even if, if you think of the courtside seat at an NBA game, what other sport has that where the athletes are literally spilling onto you in the middle of the game? And I think by developing that closeness that it, it creates interest in other aspects of the players. And, and one thing that's been fantastic about social media, it, it, we've always known these athletes were truly multidimensional, but when through social media, you say, all right, this is what this guy wears, this is what he cares about, this is the music he listens to, this is the car he drives, this is where he's from, he, this is he raises, you know, thoroughbred horses in the offseason, yes. as you were mentioning. That, so, I, I, you know, to me, I, but I also hear you that that over time can't be a substitute for the live game. Instead, it should be a tease. It should be used as a, a way to engage people to say, OK, I now know more about Victor Wembanyama. I know his dad's from the Congo. He grew up in France. He played professional basketball there. He's seven foot four. He's an elegant guy. He speaks five languages, but now I want to see him play basketball. And, and that can't be lost. And, and I think that's part of our job, for, just like this in-season tournament, to bring people back to the game and the competition. And using, I'll just say lastly, you're talking about social and digital media. To me, you know, and, and of course ESPN is our partner, we're just scratching the surface in terms of the broadcast themselves on how much more engaging we can make them. And part of that will come through streaming technology where you can, if, look, a lot of people don't want anything to do with sports betting, but if you want something to do with sports betting, you'll be to, able to engage in the telecast because you'll say click, click, and for people who want nothing to do it, they won't have to see odds or anything else, but people are interested. For people who want to buy the shoes that the player is wearing, mm -hmm. click. For people who want to see um, different statistics, people want to play fantasy games, people who want to be talking to a group of friends while they're watching a game, they'll be able to do all that as well. And I think that will create a much more engaging experience for fans. I've learned Kevin Hart's doing a mega cast this year too. Yeah. All right, yeah. Kevin Hart's going to be on, on, on ESPN2 
on Saturday night during our championship game. Okay, here we go. Kevin Hart's getting involved. That means the numbers are going to go up. But you just mentioned something there that is obviously a massive piece of the puzzle for all sports going forward. Go ahead, Connor. Yeah, Commissioner, you mentioned sports betting, and every league kind of deals with the whole, you know, oh, this is rigged because fans get pissed when their team loses. And the NFL right now and last year was going through the whole, you know, this is scripted section of, you know, their league. But with the growth of sports betting, how do you manage not only like what you know books or companies you're associated with, but also maintaining kind of the the, the league and the game in its purest form before you know the sports gambling got all involved? And obviously, it's so early in its transition. Where do you see it? You know, 10, 15, 20 years down the road. Right. So, so you know, a, a, a many great points, and I I just begin by the. The system that I grew up in and lived with at the league for most of my time here, and then the, the, the regulate, regulated legal system we have now. So in the, in the so-called old days, with a few exceptions like Las Vegas, sports betting was illegal. C- certainly sports betting online was I- illegal. And for the most part, because there wasn't the internet as we know it now, the illegal betting took place largely in person, you know, betting slips, you know, meeting in certain places to, you know, to settle, et cetera. And that's how betting worked. And it was almost impossible, short of a scandal for the league to track the kind of money that was moving on our games. So now move to the, 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 the regulatory structure we have now, which I think was largely as a, a result of the internet disrupting sports betting In the same way, it's disrupting television. Now, when you think about streaming, it's really just internet television. So it's it's now disrupting this industry. And in the regulatory framework now, where to the the extent it's legal, people are betting with their credit cards. Therefore, they have to identify themselves. And if there's any unusual activity, to kind of analogize it to a stock market. If there's insider trading or something unusual happening, very sophisticated computers, from the stock exchange, their algorithms go off, flags go off, and they, they at least know to investigate. Why is this stock moving so much at this moment when there hasn't been a disclosure of any new information? So we can do similar things around our games now to try to track unusual behavior. So to me, the choice that we have as a league isn't, is there gonna be sports betting or not sports betting? It's gonna be, is there gonna be transparency? Is there gonna be a legal framework around it? So your question about our partners, so we choose to license our data. We're not directly in the sports business, sports betting business and don't think we should be, but we license the data feeds from our game to companies like FanDuel and DraftKings and MGM and others um, so that they have the authentic feed from the game. They get it in real time because as you guys know, a lot of the betting now around games, and this is something that's very different from betting that took place years ago, is what they call in play. People don't wanna just bet the game and then check what the results later. They want to be doing things right. Quarter scores, you know, number of defensive rebounds in the first half. All you know, you can almost imagine any permutation that people can bet on, and they are. And so, on one hand, I think it's frankly great for the league that it cause, creates additional engagement. On the other hand, just like any th- problematic behavior, we have to monitor it. We have to work with government regulatory agencies. We have to work collectively as leagues to do everything we can to monitor problematic gambling to make sure that you know, minors don't have access to it to make sure that people who do engage in it don't do it over their head. I mean, it's it's not that different from the fact that we're in the business of selling beer and alcohol. It's also, you know, it it can be an enjoyable aspect of people's lives if done in a reasonable way, but also can cause enormous problems in people's lives. Yeah, the football world was dealing with that there for a bit. (laughs) People were losing their jaws every single weekend, Mm -hmm. pretty much. That's That all falls under your belt, I guess, as commish. What all do you oversee? Everything? You ever, like, for instance, I read on the internet this morning that you were the one that allowed the timeout to happen last (laughs) night by LeBron to Austin Reeves because that won the game for the Lakers. That's what I heard. You were on the phone while it was happening (laughs) and said, that was a timeout, was it not? That's what I heard you do. Can you clarify whether or not you do that and that's how you spend your Uh, evenings, Kamish? You know, that was so, it was late Eastern time where I am. I was, truth be told, I was watching the game, lying in bed, I don't have any buzzers or buttons or anything <laughs> that had any impact We're on me. Breaking! And, 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 that's and, and, breaking news. And I don't news. say as I as I was watching that that that's what no, is known at at the league office as 
a very close call. Very close. Very close. It was a close call. Yeah, very, very, (laughs) very close. Yeah. I do find it funny, though, that as the commissioner, and I guess you get paid well enough to kind of handle it, anything that seems up or with the gambling now or with obviously fan bases, it goes immediately to Adam Silver. Mm -hmm. Adam Silver's the one who made him call it last night, and that's just your life. Hey, you're doing an incredible job, though. I think you should take a victory lap at some point. And you coming on this show is so incredibly stupid. I assume there's a lot of people that told you not to do that. We're very grateful you did, boss man. We appreciate it. By the way, no one told me not to do it. And it's, uh, it's a thrill to be here. And uh, uh, I'm going to be, and by the way, Indianapolis, are, are you right in Indianapolis or outside Indianapolis? We're outside Northeast, but we'll come to you, pal. We'll come to you down there for the All-Star Week, which is going to be fantastic here in Indy. You, you know we're, we're, we're using Lucas Oil are on you? Saturday night. For yeah. the skills challenge or what's it for? Yeah. For the skills challenge, we're going to use Lucas Oil. Are you having Larry so Bird We're going to be out? in your home stadium, and that's also where the celebrity that's game's going to be. Ooh. Celebrity game's in uh, Lucas Oil Stadium? Oh, the opposite. And I think oh, yeah. you wow. would be bringing in, in a big crowd if you were there. No, nobody wants you to see You got your jersey already. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> Thank you. This is not for Jordan. It's for the year, 2023. Uh, okay. yeah. three-point yeah. line over here. That's an NBA three-point line, but I'm in this gym. I'm in this Thunderdome. We got the hoops here. Obviously, we're big fans of the sport. Uh, but the stadium, this is like whenever the Final Four goes oh, into yeah. the it's tough, to shoot. Oh, yeah. tough to shoot early. Oh, no, Adam. I'm going to have to start working <laughs> the, the, outside. The limo, your limo will come right to the Thunderdome. <laughs> All right. Pick you up for the celebrity game. Okay. We'll be ready for you. All right. Well, we can't wait to host you. We appreciate the hell out of you for joining us, and congrats on the success of the in-season tournament, the NBA as a whole, and everything you got going on. Ladies and gentlemen, Commissioner of the NBA, Adam Silver. Yeah, Commissioner!